been preaching through uh, this year, just preaching through our memory verses for the for the month and trying to get into our minds uh, the context of the words that we're memorizing, get into our minds uh, what it is that the Lord would have us, not only just memorizing it, not by rut routine, but how can we actually apply it. And so this morning we come to the month of November, our first Sunday in the month, and we start our new memory verse, Romans 10, verse number 17. And the scripture verse says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so Paul has kind of began this chapter, and it's, it's uh, definitely to the Israel, uh, to the nation of Israel, to his fellow Israelites, and his burden for the Jews. But he kind of runs into uh, the fact that we will see here in a minute that is for all people, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so the opportunity is open to all. And Paul will, re will uh, quote scripture from the Old Testament, from Deuteronomy, from Isaiah 53 and 52. And he'll move through just kind of laying out the salvation of God and how it was promised in the past and how it's come to fruition and how now it is available to all who will call upon the name of the Lord. And so uh, this morning we want to look at faith that comes from hearing. And we want to look at not only at our responsibility for hearing it, but then our responsibility for taking it to the world around us. And both are done by faith. And I believe we'll see that this morning from this passage. So let's pray and ask God to help us as we begin. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again for the morning that you've given to us, for the blessings, Lord, of meeting together as a church family. Uh, Lord, coming together with those that are like-minded and those that, Lord, have a desire to serve you and to love you. Lord, we thank you for that old rugged cross and at that cross where you bled for us. Lord, you shed your blood for our sins and we can come to that cross and ask for forgiveness. We can seek your cleansing, Lord, and you've promised to do so. Then, Lord, as we come to a saving faith and place our faith and trust in you, you change our hearts. Lord, you give us faith to live for you. And I pray that you help us to see that this morning from this passage of Scripture. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Paul says, as he's kind of wrapping up uh, the thought here, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then he'll, he'll give us a few other thoughts at the end here. But let's go back to verse number one. And begin reading what Paul is saying. And we'll see Paul's heart for his people and for those that are around him. He says in, in verse number 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And so Paul bears a burden. As he goes around, he's been preaching and teaching. And uh, he, he's starting churches. He's a church planner. And it's just his burden for people to come to know the Lord as a Savior. And I shared with the uh, teen class this morning, sometimes we uh, give somebody a track and they'll get mad. And they'll slam the door. They don't want to hear what we have to say. We never know that that opportunity might be something that they'll pick up later, or they'll read, or they'll think about it in the future, or one day they'll stand before God and he'll judge them based on the fact that they heard the gospel. And Paul will say later in this chapter that all have heard, all will have opportunity to hear. And whether it's through the uh, general revelation of, of creation that God has put out there, that man sees that there's a God and there's a creator, I believe that all men who will seek then will get a witness. Somebody will come by and will share God with them. And Paul is laying out here that his heart's desire, his prayer, to, his prayer to God for his people, for the nation of Israel, is that they might be saved. And Paul says in verse number 2, I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And we've got a nation full of people that will be in church this morning. We've got multitudes of, of different congregations and different um, religions they might go by the name. They've got different, uh, uh, mind. <laughs> different uh, names that they'll call themselves, denominations and things like that. And so we have a zeal for God. We have a zeal to do what we think is right and to fulfill this emptiness within us. So Paul's saying that's not what saves. That's not what does it. And he doesn't want them to be ignorant of God's righteousness. It is the gospel that will change people. And so as he comes to verse number 17 again, he says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's not our religious needs. It's not what church I attended. It's not where I went, how much money I gave, or that I submitted to some baptism, or I, I did some other thing. It, it is the fact that I came to faith through the word of God, and I placed my faith and trust in Him. And so we'll see, starting in verse number 9, that faith is defined, or saving faith is defined. Paul says here that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And so Paul begins to lay out the, the requirement for saving faith. And so he defines it here as faith being the confession and belief that Jesus is who he says he is. 
And so as we look at verse number 9 and verse number 10, we'll see kind of four parts in there. And Paul starts with confessing with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. And so this confession is to agree with God in regard to who He is. God is the creator and redeemer of mankind. And God says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we've got scientists and we've got all kinds of textbooks and things out there that will tell you differently. But when you come back to the word of God, God doesn't leave it up to question. God doesn't put it out there for discussion. God simply tells us in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then God would tell us that he was going to send a Messiah, that he would send his son, who would be God in the flesh that would die for mankind. He would go to the cross and shed his blood, that he would be buried and he would rise again to save mankind from their sins. That was prophesied in the Old Testament. We saw and we see in the Gospels that that came to fruition. And now Paul is saying on this side of it, we must confess that Jesus is God, that he is who he says he is. And so we must come to agree with God in regard to who he is. We must also come to agree with God in, to, in regard to who we are. We are sinful people in need of a Savior. And that's the reason Jesus left heaven is to come to die for us. We are hell-deserving sinners. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so all of us, because of our sin, deserve death. That's the wage we earn. That's what we deserve because of who we are. And we're without hope outside the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so confession is to agree with God that Jesus is man's only hope in regard to eternal life. And so Paul is laying out, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. None of us, in and of ourselves, none of us in the world and the culture around us will come to this belief out of, out of what we're told by education, what we're told by ourselves, only by the word of God that will tell us that we're a sinner in need of a savior where we come to that. And so faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The second part of that is believe. He says, believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. And so this belief has to be that God raised Jesus from the dead. If he's still in the grave, he does us no good. He had to raise from the dead in order to have victory over death so that he could give us eternal life. And so this confession and this belief is uh, made with the mouth. And then from the heart, confession is made. Con uh, belief comes from the inside. And so not only do we have a verbal affirmation that the one understands the truth that God is giving us in verse number nine. But now we have a heart uh, application to that. And so God raised him from the dead. It means that everything the Bible says about Jesus is true and that we uh, agree with that. And again, we have to come to the scriptures. We have to be taken through the scriptures to understand these things. And again, maybe we come through uh, Genesis that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it's going to depend on what somebody might know or what their worldview is. Maybe they've never been taught about creation. They've only ever heard evolution. So we've got to start at the beginning and take them through the scriptures so that they can come to know that Christ, that God, made the heavens and the earth. And that Jesus was there and he was interactive in that. And that the Holy Spirit played a part in it as he breathed out. And so we have to take them through the scriptures so that they can come to understand these things. Not only is it a confession with a mouth and agreeing with God, a, a verbal ascertaining to that, but it has to become a heart belief as well. They had to believe that God was in the flesh, that he was incarnate, that he left heaven and came to earth to die for sinful man, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That's 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. And he now lives and he's seated at the right hand of God the Father, awaiting his return to rapture the church age believer. So faith is defined here in verses, one, uh, verses 9 and 10 as a confession with the mouth that Jesus is Lord. And they shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. He says, Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so that four parts there, I believe that, first of all, I've got to come to understand that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And I would confess that in agreement with God about who I am and who he is. And then in my heart, I begin to understand, I begin to believe out what I understand from the scriptures. Faith comes by hearing. And so I place my faith in that. My heart begins to change as I begin to understand who I am. My heart begins to change as I understand who God is and that he died for me. And my, my belief in that is, is that it is true and that if I'll ask him, I'll be saved. Then he says, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And, and it becomes something from a head knowledge, an academic acknowledgement to a heart. That I now believe it and it's beginning to change me. I, I begin to understand that God did this and that he'll save me. And then I begin to confess again 
Verse number 10 says, Confession is made unto salvation. And then I will acknowledge who I am and who Christ is and that my need of a Savior uh, to the place where I accept salvation and I'm willing to tell people that I accepted Christ as my Savior. So faith is acquired in verses 9 through 13. And we see that again, if I believe and if I'll confess, then salvation is given. And he says, thou shalt be saved. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So not only is faith defined as me accepting it, and not only accepting it as a, academically, but accepting it as a heart knowledge, an understanding, coming to a full and complete understanding and placing my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But it's acquired then through that. Faith is acquired according to these verses when it becomes a heart belief. It is not a head knowledge again or an academic understanding. James 2.19 says that the devils believe and tremble. They know who God is, but they don't trust Him for salvation. And there's a lot of people in our world today that will they know who God is and they might celebrate Christmas and they have an understanding that our calendar is based on that and that it is a story of a baby coming to earth and he, he went to the cross and he died. They, they have a knowledge of it, but it's never become a heart knowledge. It's never changed them. And they've never come to true faith from the heart. And so this indicates the heart then indicates a saving faith. It's an act of the will rather than the intellectual assent to the truth. When I understand in my heart, when I come to believe that that is true, and I'll place my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so he says, faith, uh, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So as I understand the word of God, for by grace are you saved through faith. And so it's simply God's grace that he offered the gift of salvation to me. But it's by faith that I then take that gift and I apply it. And it becomes a heart understanding and I trust him and trust him alone for my salvation. And so true faith comes from the heart. Inherent in the principle of faith is a matter of trust. And again, we've used the bench up here for different things, but if I was going to sit on this bench, I don't come in every week and check it for cracks. I don't come in every week and look at the specs on this bench. When was it made? How much weight can it hold? I simply say, if this bench is here, it's going to hold me, and I sit down on it. I expect it to hold me, and so my faith in that bench is that uh, it's from my heart for this belief that it will hold me. And so it indicates the principle of a matter of trust. Saving faith then is total dependence upon Jesus Christ alone for my salvation. I'm not trusting my good works. I'm not trusting religion. I'm not trusting how much money I give to people or to the church. I'm simply trusting Christ for my salvation. And he says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. When the simple condition of faith is met, notice the promise of God in verse number 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, the promise is, thou shalt be saved. Amen. It's a once-in-time thing. It happens at the moment of belief. As I place my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I agree with God about who I am, who he is, and where my eternal destination will be outside of Christ. And I place my faith and trust in him and ask him to save me. He says, thou shalt be saved. And in a moment of time, he saves me. He gives me eternal life. And I am now saved. And then nothing can take away that. It's a once in life thing. It's a one time thing. And I'm saved forever. And so notice then that faith is available. Number three, saving faith is available to whosoever. Again, we see in verses number 11 through 13, the scriptures say, If whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So faith is available to, to all. And Paul says he's not ashamed that, that, they would, uh, that they would acknowledge it. He says, verse number 11, that they would call on him and that they would not be ashamed, that they'll confess that. And again, it's going to come to the place where I understand it in my mind, but then it becomes a heart knowledge. I now believe that it is so, and I'm willing to tell people. And we might use the example of, of sports fans. Uh, the boys and I and Anna, we like to go to, uh, you know, I like hockey. Um, so we go sometimes to the Solar Bear games. Well, we might go there as fans of the Solar Bears simply because we like hockey and we like to watch it. But as you go into the building, you start to see people with Solar Bears hats and Solar Bears shirts and Solar Bears jerseys and Solar Bears all kinds of goofy hats that they buy. They spend money on this stuff. 
and they'll spend hundreds of dollars on a jersey that's a replica because they like the sport. Well, what are they telling you? They believe in it, that they, they wholeheartedly follow it. And so what he's telling us here that as I buy into salvation, as I come to understand it, not only as a head knowledge, but it becomes a heart knowledge, I'm willing to tell you about it because I believe it, okay? And so that's the four parts that we find in verses 9 through 10 as we come through this. I, I understand who I am. I understand who God is. That God will save me if I'll ask Him. I believe unto righteousness. It becomes something real to me, and then I'm willing to confess that, He says. And the Scripture says, Whosoever believeth on Him shall not be ashamed. We see in verse number 12 that He is rich unto all that call upon Him. Verse number 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So salvation is available to whosoever, anyone who will believe, anyone who will place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, you can take that whosoever out there and just put your name there. For God so loved Sam McFarland, or God so loved your name, that He gave His only begotten Son. That if I, Sam McFarland, or your name, will believe, He'll give you everlasting life. Acts 16, 30 and verse 31, the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas there, what must I do to be saved? They didn't ask him what his pedigree was. They didn't ask him where he was born. They didn't ask him if he was on the, name, on the list of the elect. They simply said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So throughout Scripture, we see the opportunity to be saved to whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord. Anyone who through faith will accept Jesus Christ as their Savior can be saved. And verse number 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And this comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. Look at uh, verses 14 and 15. We see number four, that saving faith is shared. He says in verse number 14, How then shall they call on Him? whom they have not believed, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And so not only is faith defined, faith is available, it's acquired through belief and confession. Faith is then shared as we have faith, we share it with someone else. Go to Romans chapter 1. And uh, just a few pages back to the left, Romans chapter 1, verse number 16 and 17, Paul kind of tells us the same thought as, as we saw in verses 1 of Romans chapter 10, his heart for his people. And as Paul begins this letter to the Romans, he, he tells them, I am not ashamed of the gospel, Romans 1, 16, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So Paul reiterates here in chapter 10, the same thing he said in chapter 1. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to anyone that will believe. In chapter 10, verse 13, he says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so that word in Romans 1, 16 is the idea we get the power of dynamite from. It is power that, that blows apart things. There's some people you might think that will never get saved. And the power of God, the witness or a testimony, maybe we hand a track to them one time and they slam the door, they're mad, they're angry. And somebody else comes by later and they've been thinking on that, that seed was planted and they come to know Christ. Or we see somebody uh, that has just a horrible life, a horrible testimony that in, the, in some time in their life gets saved. And we see that 180 degree transition as God begins to change who they are. I, I again told the teens this morning, there was a, I was downtown working one night and there was a canine guy sitting there leaning against the trunk of his car. And I said, let me ask you, if you die tonight, where would you spend eternity? And he crossed his arm to just grit it tighter. He's like, don't ever ask me a stupid question like that again. So one day, one day that question is going to come across his mind. There was somebody that was interested in my eternal destination. Lord willing, it will come before it's eternally too late. Amen. But he needs to know that somebody's concerned about where he's going to spend eternity. And so the Bible says it is the power of God unto salvation to anyone that will believe. Anyone that will put their faith and trust in God. And notice what he says in verse number 17. Again, goes parallel with what we're looking at in chapter 10. Romans 1, 17, he says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so I, see, I believe we see the transition Paul is making in chapter 10. As he says, 
How, how do we come to faith? It comes by a confession. It comes by belief. It comes by a heart understanding of who God is and placing our trust in Him. As I am saved and I begin to live for Christ and Christ begins to change my life, I now become a witness for Christ. I begin to tell others about Christ. And Paul says here in Romans 1.17, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As I have faith, I have faith to be saved, but then I have faith to live. And as I begin to share my faith with others, it is faith to faith. And that is how they're going to come to know Christ as their Savior. Through the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. They're not going to get saved if you and I aren't willing to share our faith. And so this righteousness of Christ is revealed faith to faith by us being a witness and a testimony of what Christ has done for us. Go back to Romans chapter 10 now, and you'll see that. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And so we must share the gospel. And he says that it comes down to the end of verse number 14. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And we see that word preacher and we think of, of Sam behind the pulpit or we think of some pastor that we know or maybe the pastor that preached the day we got saved. But a preacher is simply anybody that's willing to proclaim the gospel. The sense of the word here is somebody that will take it and share it. And we come to uh, verse number 15. He says, how shall they preach except they be sent? We won't turn there, but Mark chapter 16 and verse 17 says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, if he says, go ye, and you say, who, me? Yeah, you. You and you and you and me. We are to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. Well, I'm not probably going to leave the United States, but I can send a missionary and it'll go. But no missionary that is to, let's say, China or Taiwan is going to be able to reach people in Kobe, but I can go. And so we all play a part in that, both by going to our community and to those around us, maybe people we work with, and sending missionaries to the far outreaches of the world. And so we must do our part in that. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, again, tells us to go and to teach all nations. And so this idea of preaching is that we teach, that we interact with people, and that we bring them as, as well as we can to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Look at Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, I just want to show you a couple verses here. Again, Paul's burden for people. Everywhere he went, he was found preaching the gospel. He was found in the synagogues. Uh, disputing with people, persuading people according to the scriptures. Notice in Acts chapter 19, look at verse number 8. It says, Paul goes, he's here at Ephesus. He went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples. Disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years, so that they all, which dwelt in Asia, heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So we just come, I want us to see there that no matter where Paul went, he was preaching the gospel. No matter where Paul went, he was interacting with people and he was sharing Christ with them. Some he disputed with, others he simply shared. Some he preached to, others he had to convince. But Paul took the word of God and he invested in the lives of people. He went boldly, it says, for the space of three hours, uh, three months, disputing and persuading things concerning the kingdom of God. And so we are to take the gospel to all people. Some will be saved and some won't. Some will accept it and some will reject it. It's not my responsibility to save them. It is God's responsibility to save whosoever will. But God gave every one of us the opportunity to make a choice. God gave every one of us a free will, and I can accept the gospel, or I can reject it. For God so loved the world that he gave, he handed, he offered the opportunity, the free gift of eternal life. But I have to either accept the gift, or say, no thank you, I don't need it. And so Paul gave opportunity, everywhere he went, he spread the gospel, he shared the gospel, and we are to do the same thing. Here he says, how shall they call on him? Romans 10 again, verse number 14. How will they call on him whom they haven't believed? They haven't come to that faith knowledge of God. They haven't come to that understanding because somebody hasn't shared scripture with them. Somebody hasn't convinced them of who they are and who Christ is and their need of a Savior. But how shall they preach except they be sent? And so we sit back and we say, well, my church hasn't sent me. But God has. We have the great commission that we're to all go out and to take the gospel. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. 
Um, for the sake of time, we won't turn there. If you go, let's, let's go ahead. Go to Isaiah. Go to Isaiah. Chapter 52. How beautiful are the feet of them that take the gospel of peace, he says. Look at Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52 and verse number 7. The Bible says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. And so in the Old Testament we even have, not only do we have the promise of the Messiah coming, but we see that people are saved by faith, by placing their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, uh, in God, in what God says in God's word, knowing that the Messiah will come, that he's promised that he's going to die on the cross and save them from their sins. They may not have fully understood all of that, but through the sacrificial system, they were given a picture of that. It was a foreshadow of what was to come, and they simply had to take God at his word. That if I'll put my faith in this, that God is going to send his son, the Messiah, to die on the cross, then he'll save me. And so it says, how beautiful are the feet of them that bring good tidings, that publish peace, that bring good tidings of good, that publish salvation. But notice what uh, Isaiah laments in verse number 1 of chapter 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? So the gospel goes out. We preach it to all people, but only some will accept it. Some will reject it. And sometimes we get to the side of rejection and we just say, well, what's the use? What's the work? And we want to fold our arms and come home and sit down in the pew. We don't want to partake in outreach. But Isaiah says, who's going to believe our report? But it's, that's not what our responsibility is. Our responsibility is to keep telling. It's their responsibility to hear and to respond. Notice in verse number 5 what Isaiah continues to say. Uh, look at verse number 4, Isaiah 53, 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Go back to Romans chapter 10. Isaiah is simply proclaiming the gospel. He's proclaiming the Messiah would die. He would become that sacrificial, sac uh, that sacrifice on our behalf. That he would die for you and I. He would take our sins and go to the cross for you and I. So faith is shared by those who are willing to proclaim it, to share it. The Christian who is willing to take the gospel message to others. And we should all be actively involved in witnessing to someone. The Bible calls this the good news. Again, we see the good news. Those, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Romans 10 says it. Isaiah 52 says it. And it is the good tidings. Remember the angel proclaiming in Luke chapter 2? Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Behold, a Savior is born. Well, if I'm good in and of myself, if I can give to the church, if I can be religious and I can earn my way to heaven, I don't need a Savior. Only those who are in trouble, only those who need to be saved need a Savior. And God says the good news is to all people, to who, for whoever will call upon the name of the Lord. And he says how beautiful are the feet of them, the goings of those that will take the gospel out. God looks at it as a beautiful thing as they go and spread the gospel, as they go and bear precious seed out into the world. God looks on it as a good thing. The good news is the saving grace of Jesus Christ. It is the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection again of Jesus Christ according to the scriptures and by which you are saved if you believe. Uh, this entails a, a, a teller, but it also entails uh, here, look in uh, verse number 12, he says, There's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Verse number 14 and 15, we see that somebody hears and somebody is telling. And so one is willing to share the gospel, one is given the opportunity to hear. And notice in verse number 16, then, that faith is required. He says in verse number 16, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? He's simply repeating or using Isaiah 53 saying, look, not everybody's going to believe. Not everybody's going to hear our report and accept it with gladness. As we preach the gospel, as we preach the good tidings, 
Not everybody with joy is going to accept it. Some will reject it. Some will turn it away. But does that take away my responsibility of telling? No. I simply tell as many people as I can. I offer it to as many people as I can. And those that will by faith receive it will be saved. Again, verse number 11, whosoever, or verse 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So we see through these that God gave man a free will. Man must make the choice to believe or reject. Some may say that the Christian faith is based on too many unknowns. Uh, you hear from science that it is a crutch for those who are too weak-minded to accept science as the final authority. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 with me. Let's once again look at the Bible definition of faith here in Hebrews chapter 11. We'll begin wrapping up. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 1. The Bible says or defines faith as the substance of things hoped for. Titus describes it as the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so the substance of things hoped for, the substance is something that is tangible. And so my faith is in the tangible uh, word of God and what God tells me that if I'll place my faith and trust in him, that he'll save me. It's the evidence of things not seen, like the wind as it goes by. We don't know that the wind is out there. We might hear it rustling in the trees or we see the leaves moving. We might feel it on our face, but outside of that, we don't. When I breathe in, I don't, I don't know if the air is there, but I breathe in trusting that it's going to be there for me. And so the same thing, faith is the evidence of things seen. Also, faith is what allows us to obtain a good report. Verse number two, it says, for by it, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So as we read through here and see what God says about faith, true faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. It is how we obtain a good report with God. It's how we come to obtain an understanding of who God is and that He's the creator of the universe, the redeemer of mankind, and the sustainer of those who trust Him. Verse number 6 tells us, Without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. So by faith I place my trust in Jesus Christ. It is again a heart decision that I make. I allow my will to be bent by the Savior and by the Word of God, and I trust Him for what He says, and I accept Him and His finished work on the cross. Look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. Again, our faith is based in more than just an unknown. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 15. Second Peter chapter 1, verse number 15. The Bible says, Peter is speaking here, and he says, Moreover, I would endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. And again, trying to hurry up, you know, trying to wrap up for us. But I told the teens this morning, as Daniel goes into captivity, he's taken into captivity, he's separated away from his family. He's only got a few little friends there, and they're being brainwashed. Everything they know, how they eat, how they worship, their names, everything's being changed to try to brainwash them into the thinking of the Babylonians. But they had to stand in true in what they knew. And the only way I told our young people is that you're going to be able to do this in a world that is around us is by hiding God's word in your heart, by knowing what the scriptures say. And so Peter's saying the same thing, moreover, why endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. Peter says, I'm going to preach it to you, I'm going to preach it to you, I'm going to preach it to you, I'm going to keep you in the word of God so that when I'm dead and gone, these things are stuck in your brain. And that's my hope is that we spend enough time in the Word of God and that we're investing in our young people by the preaching and teaching the Word of God that when you and I are dead and gone, they're still investing the Word of God into the future generations because they're solid in their beliefs. They're solid in their understandings. They know what it is that they believe and why they believe it. Verse number 16, Peter says, We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John observed that they were eyewitnesses 
that God says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. This voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Until the day dawn and the, dark, and the day star arise in your hearts. Peter says now we have a word of God. A more sure word. Peter says I would, I would put more faith in the word of God than what I saw with my own eyes. I put more faith in the word of God than what I heard with my own ears. And I'm passing that on to you. When I'm dead and gone, I want you to understand that it is the word of God that your faith and trust needs to be in. He says, knowing this verse, no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false prophets or teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Peter says, listen, I'm telling you the truth. I'm giving you the word of God. You need to base your faith and trust on that. There are going to be others that will come in and say all kinds of crazy things. They'll try to lead you astray. It is the work of the devil in the world that we live in. But you need to keep your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Notice as he says there in verse number 19, a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well, that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. John chapter 3 tells us what? Light came into the world, but men reject the light. Why? Because they're sinners and they don't want to be exposed for who they are. We want to wrap ourselves in a cloak and we want to be pious and we want to look good. But by pride, we're on our way to hell and we're afraid to admit it. God says, put it on. Allow the light to shine into your life. Allow the light of the gospel to search you. And by faith comes hearing. And hearing is by the word of God. Listen this morning. Faith is the result of hearing. Hearing is the result of someone telling. Telling is the result of obedience. Obedience is the result of faith. Faith is the result of hearing. It's a cycle. I'm saved because I heard the gospel. Because somebody was willing to tell. Because they were obedient to go and tell. And now it's my job. As I came to know Christ through faith, I am now have thought to be obedient to the, to the gospel and to tell others about that. Faith then is the result of hearing. As I hear that I am to go and to tell... I then obey and I go and tell other people. And as we see people saved and we disciple them, they then ought to go. So we're saved by faith and we live by faith this morning. Let me ask you as we close, are you saved this morning? Have you come to a saving faith through hearing the word of God? If not, we'd love to take the scripture and show you how you can be saved according to the Bible. You have the choice then to make whether to accept it or reject it. Are you telling others about Jesus and what he's done for them? It's all about faith and obedience, living and telling. Let's pray.